Thank you. Um, extremely brief uh, introduction on Bjorn for those of you who don't know that al already. And uh, Adi and I have been writing this uh, presentation together. So Adi, can you shortly introduce yourself? Yes, I'm going to look here so you can see me properly. Uh, so I'm Adi, I've been developing C++ since before the first standard. I do a lot of computer vision, algorithms, uh, machine learning, uh, some real time. And um, I read about this subject uh, about a year ago and uh, I happened to be talking to Bjorn online before we actually ever met face to face. And said, oh, this, this would be a really cool thing to do. So yeah, you, you can take it from there. Okay, so yeah, the curiously recurring coupled types pattern. Um, I think I think it's probably best that we we introduce this with a bunch of examples, and you can see that there is a, a, a pattern in these examples. I, I, I'll go through a, a few. And uh, by the way. Please interrupt at any point if, if uh, there is something you're wondering about or something you would like to repeat it or whatever. Uh, disagreement, that is always fun. So, so let's, uh, let's see some examples. Do we have a 2D space because it's so difficult to write, to draw in 3D, especially when you're graphically handicapped as I am. Uh, so we have a vector. 2D vector, we call it V1. And we have another vector, V2, in, in this uh, two-dimensional space. And uh, an important thing about vectors here is that they have a direction and a length. Uh, they don't really have a position, but I have to draw them somewhere. So we, we, we can slide them around. It doesn't matter. It, nothing has changed. And we can add vectors. So V3 here is the, the sum of V1 and V2 by just sort of sliding the vectors so that you concatenate them. Then you get the, uh, the resulting vector. Uh, subtracting a vector is just reversing its direction. <coughs> so V1, V1 minus V2 is just sliding the, the reversed vector and getting the sum. So I presume no one is very surprised over this. We can also uh, scale a vector by multiplying with a scalar, uh, in this case, uh, double its size. Or we could divide it to get it shorter. Multiplying vectors, uh, not in this world. In, uh, in some situations, that makes sense, but not in this world. We're not doing that. This is clear so far, I presume. Nothing surprising. And we have points in space. Point exists, it's a, a location somewhere, a position. We can have some other position. And we say that the difference by, we get by subtraction, subtracting two points is, is the vector from one point to another. So in this case, P2 minus P1 is the vector that gets you from P1 to P2. And we can add other vectors to get another point because a point plus a vector is a, is a point. A position plus a vector is a position. Can we add a point? No. I actually cannot imagine what that would mean. So no, we cannot do that. So enough of that. Uh, what did you say the, the time was in Israel, Adi? It's now just a bit after eight. A bit of, okay, we haven't started yet. That is interesting. Uh, <laughs> wow, um, okay. The Chrono Library, if you're familiar with that from, from this, C++ standard library. So this uh, extremely ugly construction is uh, a clock face. So we have two points in time now represented by clock phases. So if we subtract them, what, what is the question mark? What is that? 
A duration, yes, exactly. It's the amount of time that has passed between the, these two time points. Like so. Can we add time points? No. Doesn't make sense. And we can add a duration to a time point to get another time point. Does, the, does that sort of ring familiar with the vector example? Where we have points in space, and, or in this case, points in time, and we have vectors in space or durations in time. Pointer arithmetic, everybody loves that, right? Yay. Yay. <laughs> I'm guilty of having watched a, a Norwegian uh, pop science program called Ikke gjør dette hjemme. Don't do this at home. Uh, in this case, it's reversed. Please do this at home, but not at work. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an array of uh, a number of things, <laughs> and we can get a, a pointer to one of the elements in the array and another pointer to another element in the array. So what is the meaning of subtracting two pointers? What, what do we get? What is the type of D? What, what, what is the meaning of D? You have to show. PTRD. Uh, PTRD of T, yeah. What's, uh, what's PTRD of T? What, what a kind of type is that? It's a signed, inter signed integral type, yeah. What, what, what is the value? What does it mean? Distance, yes. So it's the number of A's to travel along the array from, from P1 to get to P2. <coughs> Can we add pointers? No. No. I don't know. What that would mean if we could. That's probably the reason we can't. Uh, but I can also do the other thing. I can have a point and uh, add or subtract a, a PTR DFT to get another, another pointer. Like so. So X is the same as same value as P1, points to the same element. So are you seeing a pattern here? Because here's the interesting thing. Uh, all we're going to say today are things that you already know. Bummer, eh? Um, yeah. Adi posted this uh, January last year. Great introduction to affine geometry. Uh, Alcalc 1, novel algebraic operations for affine geometry. Uh, and I just had to respond. I think you may just have solved a long-standing naming problem for me. Because at that time, I don't know, some of you may know this, I have an experimental strong type library that I've been working on. And uh, I also watched uh, uh, Peter Holmberg's talk here in Stockholm about uh, concepts. And uh, he stressed how important it, it is for your, for your concepts to not be super detailed, but sort of to embrace big ideas. And I felt that this is the same thing, but in reverse. Instead of describing a constraint for a, a generic type, I'm constructing a type that has some uh, semantic meaning. And it felt like this behavior is something I want to model, but how can I model it if I cannot name it? And I did solve that for me. So thank you. And I think you. it's your turn now. Yeah. Okay. So the pattern that we've all been seeing, and, I'm, and I was in exactly the same position when I saw all these things, and I wanted to know how you actually call this, because most of the mathematics that we see and we learn in, even at the university are always, all the operations are closed over a single type, what's called the monoid, but that, that's just the mathematical name. And here we have something slightly different than not very typical for, for the regular, the kind of math that we, even if you learn some more modern abstract algebra, and even if you go to some of the more basic category theory, everything is still a monoid. 
But here we have two types which are related very intimately with some very strict and rigid rules. And, and I was reading on Slack and somebody, just as an offhand remark, said affine space. And I come from, I do a lot of computer vision and graphics and I've always known about affine transformations. And it turns out there, there, there is some mathematical relationship between them, but it's actually very uh, indirect. So it's really unrelated to those, and it's unrelated to something from language theory, which is called affine types. That's where, why we're not actually calling it affine types, although this talk is actually about types. It's about the affine spaces. Now, in math, an affine space intuitively comprises of two different types. The first one is a point. It's a position specified with some coordinate values. And these types of points, they have many, many different um, names in different domains. So we might call them locations if it's a GPS coordinate. They could be uh, vertices in a graphical context. They could be addresses in memory. They could be time points on, on some kind of clock. The second entity, which Bjorn just saw, showed, I'll call it a vector, but it's actually the dif it's defined as the difference between two points. And again, this vector, which is a very abstract mathematical thing, basically something that has only a direction and a length, has different names. It might be called a shift or an offset, a displacement, can be called the duration, really depending on the actual context, but the, mathematical, the, abs the abstract mathematical concept remains exactly the same. And these two types, or these two entities, have very intimate relationships, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. There's one thing that, uh, there's a comment here, which is, oh, just go back one second. One more. Oh. There's a comment here that sometimes uh, we don't necessarily have an origin, because when we have this separation between positions and displacements, we don't really need to know where the origin is. And many, if you if you read the literature about affine space, it's some, sometimes called, it's a vector space that forgot its origin. Because even if the origin is known, then any point can be represented as a vector from the origin. However, a point is still not a vector in the coordinate free space. So even though your representation, let's say of the 2D example, might be two, a tuple of two numbers, these are separate entities. They're not the same type. They, have, they behave differently in different contexts. They have different algebraic uh, rules. Now let's see these rules. Yeah, next slide. And see some of the definitions. So, as I said, the affine space it has two types of entities. It has points and vectors. And of course, I'm not counting scalar, scalars here, but they, are, they, are, they exist. And they exist, obviously, because the first rule is that the vectors, they're, they, uh, they're closed under the normal vector space operation. So if you go back to the uh, linear algebra one, these are the, the typical vectors that we all, uh, everybody might, might be familiar with. But we must remember this is not to, not necessarily 2D vectors. Like we saw in the chroma example, this may be one-dimensional vector, right? So, the, or in, a, in a, the difference between two pointers is a we call it an offset in memory, but it, it's a, it's some kind of number that represents a, a shift in the memory address space. So it's a one-dimensional vector. Now, the thing that affine spaces add, add above normal vector spaces are the two rules that define the relationships between points and vectors. So if we have a unique, uh, if we have two points, P and Q, then we say that the difference between them is called the vector is going, and, it, and that vector behaves like any vector in a vector space. But the points do not actually, the points are not part of the vector space. They have their own uh, being, their own entity, and they stay, they remain the same, essentially, if they're, Kind of, it's like if we're in Modin right now and Bjorn is in Stockholm, we can't subtract or move these positions because we're here and he's there. We can measure the distance between us. We can uh, maybe throw a paper airplane from here to there and hope, hope it will get there. Uh, um, but there's no way to do an operation on a point. And of course, we can reverse that, just like Bjorn showed. We can add a vector to a point to get a vector. So in fact, these two uh, assignment or, or equality operators have two different types. It's like if we think about it as operators or operative overload, overloading, these are two different types in the parameter list and two, diff and then two different types in the return value, right? So um, yeah, and, and here we can, I wrote, we wrote down the operations 
that are supported by Affan Space APIs. So now, remember, I'm not actually trying to teach you math. I'm trying to show you that there is a mathemat a very solid 200-year-old mathematical uh, basis for how to do API design. And whenever you encounter this pattern of affine spaces, these are the, the types of operations that your types must uh, support. And generally, these are the only ones. Like we saw, there are some operations that don't make sense, like adding points. So on the vector operations, these are on the left. These are the normal, typical vector space operation, the closure under uh, uh, addition, and subtraction, and uh, multiplication by a scalar. Of course, subtraction is just addition with the multiplication of the inverse, right? So these are, this is even, uh, in terms of axioms, uh, actually fewer than these five. And the additional three affine operations that we have are the fact that a vector is the result of the subtraction between two points. So we have a subtraction operator taking two point type objects and returning a vector. And similarly, we can add a point and a vector to, re to get another point. Right, so let's go back to the chrono example and see some actual code and see how chrono, the chrono implementation is one of the best examples for affine space API. <laughs> um, truly inspirational. And we'll see exactly how these operations, uh, what these operations look like uh, in Chrome. So this is just a very simple uh, slide, slide where. So we can define a system clock now that returns a time point. We call it begin. Then we do some very important work uh, and uh, end with the, the, the end time. When we, on line three, we can subtract, subtract the beginning from the end to get a new duration, not a point. So in fact, do is a duration, the type, it's a uh, chrono duration. And then we can do some basic math with the same arithmetic rules that we just saw. So uh, almost is the sum of the point, which is big, plus a duration minus another duration. So one millisecond, this is a user, this is a, a standard literal uh, from chrono, <laughs> is the duration. And of course, we can subtract duration. We can add that to the begin. Same, similar about next. We add uh, a, the duration. The duration is a regular vector. Remember, it's, it's a one-dimensional vector, but it's still a vector. It can be scaled using scalars. And we can find that uh, next is twice as long. Now, just so we get a, a little extra, here's an example. The last, uh, the UTC now and UTC next, this is C plus, 20, C plus 20 from the corona extension to time zones. Since we're doing a distributed uh, meetup now, so let's see some C plus 20 with different time zones. So in this case, UTC now is the time, the clock, the time uh, at the uh, UTC clock, which is in Greenwich Village. It's not the local time here. And UTC next, again, I can add the duration, twice the duration to UTC now. Everything works okay. However, remember that UTC now is a different, it, it's still a time point, and it talks about the same time point in our global universe, right? But it has what I called before, it's a, it has a different origin. The origin is Greenwich, the Greenwich line. It's not Israel standard time, and it's not Swedish standard or European, Central European time. So now on the last line, I'm trying to subtract two time points. And we said, we, I just told you that it's, a, it's fine to subtract two time points, right? And as you see, this isn't actually going to compile because these two time points are related to different clocks, and the algebra doesn't allow that. So you can think of, hmm? there are different types because these time points are templated on the clock, right? That's really important, and this is one of the important messages we're going to see it later. Semantics uh, implies syntax and syntax and va only valid syntax implies valid syntax. <laughs> invalid syntax implies invalid syntax. It's not allowed by the compiler. So the compiler is enforcing mathematical semantics of our types. This is the important part of but this talk. Isn't there is a casting between there, you the can casting? you can do a clock cast in, yes. in, in chrono C plus twenty. Uh, the question was is if there is a casting between the two time points. Indeed, there is. It's called clock STD chrono clock cast, but you have to call it explicitly. Okay. Oh, and by the way, in chrono, one important thing is that, uh, contrary, for example, to 2D vectors, uh, 
time points and durations may be implemented totally differently. So the internal representation is not just necessarily a single number. In general, it has a lot of things with STD ratios and that kind of thing. So uh, again, this is another abstraction. The presentation may be different. Okay, next. Iterators. Everybody, you see it's the pointers with the sparkly point. <laughs> Um, right, so let's see uh, this example with STD vector. It looks essentially very similar to what we would expect with pointers. Uh, we have a vector take it with four elements. We take the beginning, the end. We can subtract these two uh, iterators because iterators, remember, they be their time points. They're, they're like the time points. They're positions. We can subtract them to get an integer. Notice this is not an iterator. It's an integer or it's an iterator oh, difference, right? Uh, and we can do some uh, regular operations. And in fact, in some older STL versions, STD vector iterators were implemented by pointers. So it's not surprising that the same syntax would work exactly the same. I do want to make my, one more note about pointers, that even when the language C was designed, and probably earlier than that, somebody made the conscious choice of making pointers a distinct type from just an index into the memory address space. So somebody already 40 or 50 years ago, because this is probably goes earlier than C, uh, already understood that affine spaces have an important aspect in the type system, okay? I think this is really, it's a big insight that I had when I was researching my blog post about this. Now, okay, but now you're saying, okay, but the STD vector is essentially like an array and everything uh, behaves like pointers. So how does that hold for containers, which are like associative containers, which do not have consecutive memory and the relationship to pointers is tenuous? Next slide. Right, so here I have the same example with STD set. And the code is essentially identical, or I would go for, as far as I say, it's semantically identical syntactically a little bit different because in this case, instead of uh, when we, of course, we set the values into the set, we take the beginning iterator, the end iterator, and we want to count the difference between begin and end. Instead of using subtraction, we can use std distance. Instead of using uh, uh, this plus operator, we can use std next, which has a second argument, which tells you how, how many uh, elements, how many steps we want to jump ahead. There's also something called STD advance, which is like the plus equals operator. <coughs> I didn't mention it before with the operator, I didn't want to overload the slide, but of course, if your data is mutable, you can always add the syntactic sugar of plus equals and uh, star equals and so on, minus equals. You could use the same syntax at the You have to first. shout. You, you could use the same syntax at the vector, right? It could, it could you, be the same. No, you can't. Uh, it, you can use the same syntax as the vector only for random access iterators. If they're not random, let's say I use the std forward list here, you can't. Or, or it might be because these have different uh, complexity guarantees for different iterator types. Yeah, but the, the result would be the same, right? No, but they don't support operator overloading. They do support distance next? Yes. What's the main semantic meaning of distance? Distance? You know what? In a set. What's the distance between an ID? A set is a sorted it's a sorted it's container. Sorted. It's, it's, it's not unordered. It's, it's not unordered. In a hash table it has no meaning. In set is uh, it's sorted by the operator less than. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so just to, to show you that this is not very as common as we would hope it would be, I'll show you some counter examples. Now, in this case, I've been using uh, the OpenCV, the Open Source Computer Vision Library for many years, so I'm going to pick on that. But this is in no way limited only to OpenCV. So uh, we have this type called CV point. It's a 2D point. We can define the position to be, in this case, the owl. Um, and... Um, yeah, can you see the owl? Yeah. Can everybody see the owl now? That's all you can see now, right? <laughs> um, and now we can do all these strange operations on points, which it's really unclear what they mean. I mean, how? what does it mean to, first of all, to construct a point from a vector? Okay, maybe we say, okay, it's the distance 
the point at some kind of offset from the origin. Maybe we can live with that. But what does it mean to actually add two points? What, what's the semantic meaning in any geometric domain <laughs> to do the addition of two points? But OpenCV supports this without a problem. Again, the, the, we can take the difference between two points and get the direction, but the direction is not a displacement. It's a point. So how did we suddenly go from a 2D offset to some position in space? What's the relationship here? As we saw in, in Bjorn's example, you can move vectors around and it's still the same vector, right? And similarly, we can scale them and, and multiply them. What does it mean to scale a point? Totally unclear. Uh, and again, just to say, OpenCV is not the only library that does this. PCL, the point cloud library, uh, suffers from the same thing. Uh, Eigen, which is a, an excellent uh, linear algebra header only library, also ignores this aspect. Uh, there's a library called the Computational Geometry, uh, Geometry uh, Algorithm Library, and they actually are a final way. So I will give them credit. Now, you might ask yourself, oh, oh wait, wait. Um, you might ask yourself, why does it matter? Why do we care? I mean, this is really convenient to write because I know if I'm in a vector or a displacement or a point. And all I can say is the next slide. Remember the Mars Climate Orbiter, <laughs> right? Because uh, this is a multi-billion dollar Mars exploration surveying mission. And basically software that calculated total impulse produced by thruster firings produced results in pound four seconds. The trajectory calculation software then used these results expected to be in Newton seconds to update the predicted position of the spacecraft. So this spacecraft arrived at Mars and basically crashed itself because of a unit mismatch. So, and my point here is that there is a very, uh, very uh, big analogy between the type of affine types that are, we're talking about and unit systems. It's the kind of thing that we have to keep the stronger our type system is, the more bugs and error will be caught at compile time instead of runtime or post-launch time, right? So, yeah, so remember the, not, not just the VASA, remember the Mars Climate Orbiter. Next. Okay, so uh, I think this is Bjorn's going to show you something, some cool talk. Yeah, uh, so... Um... I've been studying a, a number of uh, GUI libraries. The, I'm, I'm really not a GUI programmer, but, but um, after at the end I agreed to try to do this talk, I, I sort of made it a point to study a number of GUI libraries. And just to give examples, I'm, I'm showing a, a completely imaginary GUI library, so nothing like this exists. So I have a, I have a library where I can create a, a window, and in this case, the constructor takes a point for the bottom left corner and a size. And you can see the uh, alias at the, the top there that the size is a 2D vector. So on the right, you can see how we can create a window with, if I have two points, I have the bottom, bottom left and the top right corner, I can create them using uh, the, the point P1 for a bottom left and I can calculate the size from uh, P2 minus P1 because subtracting two points is a vector. Or I maybe uh, want to, to translate a, a window on the screen. And for, for, for that, I use uh, an offset to say, I want to move it this far in this direction. So it, of course, takes a, a vector. And uh, if I don't have, again, a vector, I can calculate one using the point that is my desired new position for the window. Or maybe I have a, a function to, to move it to a specific point. And uh, as Adi was showing about uh, other graphics libraries or, or uh, 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 vector algebra libraries, uh, they have a tendency to not get this right. And I cannot claim to have studied all GUI libraries, but of those, those I have studied, not a single one got this right. Every one of them confused points and uh, offsets. 
helter skelter. Uh, and uh, that is a missed opportunity to be expressive in your API, say, what do I actually mean here? What do I want? And it's also a missed opportunity to catch errors. So I'm wearing the t-shirt. Let's see how this works. So did you know that uh, you can include URLs in, in Compiler Explorer? Yep. Cool. <laughs> now you do. If you didn't, now you knew. Now you, now you do. Um, so I, after Adi and I, we met at uh, NDC Oslo and wrote the abstract for, for this talk. And uh, on my way home, I was bored at uh, Oslo Airport waiting for my flight. So I wrote a library for the generic affine space types. And that is what I'm using here. So I have a generic 2D vector type with integers that I just have a position X and Y and I, I can add them. So th this is the, the typical <laughs> GUI library type that, that we don't know if this is a, an offset or a position. So we don't want that. So what I can do is use this uh, library and say, no, I have 2D vector. Uses the V uh, as its uh, representation, and I have a tag on it. The, the tag is just there to, to make it a unique type. So I can have, let, let's say the V is uh, an int instead. I can have several displacements of type, type int, but with different tags, and then they are completely different types, and I cannot confuse them, which is a very good thing. Uh, and then I say that I have, it, a position type that is an affine position, again using V with its tag. And I say that, yeah, and by the way, my, uh, my vector type is, is this one, Vec2D. <coughs> Another way of uh, easier achieving the same is to, to say that my position is V and the, and the tag, and my vector is the displacement type automatically. Uh, the automatic displacement is represented by the type you get by subtracting two positions and use the same tag as the position type does. That is cool. And with this, we can write pretty much the same code. I have this window, and I have some silly create function that takes uh, four ints. And we can see how how this is translated into quite efficient uh, assembly language. Um, did you know, by the way, that 32-bit ints are passed uh, in pairs as 64-bit values in registers? I did not know until I watched uh, this example. So that's why I have this uh, huge it's, uh, the mask. But the cool thing with this is uh, if if I make a mistake, so I accidentally happen to try to create a window with, uh, with the upper right point instead of the, the size, I get a compilation error. And the compilation error says that there is no conversion from pos 2 d uh, to size. So we have translated what was a, a semantic mistake, a, a, a runtime error, into a syntactic error, a compilation error. That's a good thing. And I can still access the, uh, the, the members uh, X and Y if I wanted to, to, in this case, have an assertion to say that, yeah, the uh, the upper right corner really better be above and to the right of the lower left one. So now, of course, the example is, oh, I should probably not use mdebug for that. So the example obviously is a little bit bigger now since it needs to move, do jumps, compares and jumps to these uh, assert errors. <laughs> so 
it's fairly easy to, to create a, a to create the types you need for, to encapsulate the, the semantics that you want. Um, I can show other examples also, but I, you've seen it. It's, it's nothing super exciting there. So, let's go on. Not that. Um, by the way, the the links there are to to this uh, library and to the God, Godbolt example if you want to play with them. Um, I also really want to say something about uh, just briefly mentioned uh, Peter Holmberg here from Stockholm. He, who I mentioned, held a, a talk about concepts. Uh, he has a work in progress. <laughs> Oh. Uh, he has a work in progress uh, library called Elements that defines a number of useful uh, concepts. Uh, one of them is an affine space concept. Um, he contacted me before this talk and, and uh, apologized for not being able to be here, but he, he gave me the link. So, of course, I have to show it. Uh, so, but beware that it, this is work in progress, it's not done yet. But it, you kind of recognize, I guess, the examples that, that Adi showed where that the requires clauses, we say that if, if we have a two points P, the subtractive then must be get a V, the type V, which is a, a vector, and P plus V is a P. Uh, so P is point, V is vector, S is scalar in this example. And also that you can do plus equals and minus equals. So I wanted to mention these, uh, also the, the connection to concepts. So back to you, Adi. Yeah. Okay, now I still feel like I, I owe you something, and I don't know if anyone if anyone noticed this. And I, I said before, what does it mean to add two points? And let me get to that in a minute. There's another additional concept that comes from affine spaces, and that's what's called an affine combination. An affine combination is a weighted sum of one or more points. Hold, hold that thought. Such that one of three things, or actually one of two things holds. The first one is that the total sum of weights is exactly one. So it's, uh, uh, and, and then the resulting type is a point. The second one is the total sum of weights is exactly zero, and then the result is a vector. Otherwise, this operation is undefined. This seems kind of, uh, again, when you see the definitions, it might appear slightly arbitrary and not really something you might think of an example of, but we'll see that in a second. Uh, anyone who's done some computational geometry, might have got, you might have come across the term of barycentric coordinates. So barycentric coordinates are really the tuple of weights of a, uh, the sum of weight, uh, a weighted sum of points where all the weights sum up to one. And this is kind of, if it might remind anyone of something, we'll see that in a minute. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So let, let's let's see an example. Then we have this operation m equals the sum of a and b divided by two. And you don't need to be a big expert because it actually says that it's looking for the midpoint, right? Uh, because this is uh, the mean or the average or this is a weighted sum, uh, essentially uh, of uh, we're taking uh, the, the average between two points. Uh, so Next, in the case where these are integers, what would a plus b divided by 2 be? Oh, hmm? An integer. An integer in the middle of we, let's ignore um, truncation and uh, overflow in this case. 
because for the, for <laughs> conceptually, M is the midpoint between them. However, if A and B are in are, are pointers to it, so what is the result of this operation? Anyone in Sweden, maybe? Yeah, you can't add pointers, right? So here the type system suddenly uh, kind of comes back and bites us because if we have an array and we want to find the middle element, we have a pointer to the beginning, we point it to the end, the middle element would be the middle element. We would want to do this kind of operation. So what, what can we do instead? Next slide. Yeah, we can rewrite it either this way, which I'm guessing most of you didn't think about this way of writing it, right? But again, this A is, uh, yeah, most of you might have thought about writing opening uh, half times A plus half times B. Um, but then again, this doesn't compile because you can't multiply a, a pointer by a scalar. So you actually must use the first operation where we take, this, we subtract, we get the difference between the last and the first, divide that number, that integer, that signed integer by two, and we add that offset to our pointer. Um, if you want to calculate center of gravity in any dimension, uh, for example, in three dimensions, we have three points, P, Q, and R. We need to take, conceptually, take the sum of these points and then multiply, uh, divide that by the number of points. Or alternatively, we can think about it as the weighted sum of the points weighted by weights which sum up to one, right? So this is where affine combinations really come from, is when we want to calculate um, interpolations between points, and in these cases, these are very special cases of uh, linear combinations. However, there is no support for arbitrary weights. So we can only have um, weights that sum up to one. Um, it's totally, oh wait, go back one minute. So uh, the last comment is that it's not trivial to actually uh, do this in code. How can we let the compiler know that a particular addition is of points is part of a larger affine combination operation? Uh, I think there is a, it's possible to do it if the number of elements in the sum <laughs> is known at compile time. Um, it might be possible with lazy evaluations and template expression uh, decomposition. Um, but again, it's totally non-trivial, and, and uh, this is still an open question. I would love for somebody to come up with uh, something to show how that would happen. Right. So just just to close this particular part of the, of the math, uh, now let's look at the summary of what I what we think is the, the main take-home messages. And and I think these messages are really bigger than affine types. Affine, I'm sure you will find affine types in your type systems. But it's important when you're coming to design your APIs, you have to think about the semantics, and they will guide you how to write your types, how to design your types. And strong APIs basically always strive to create this if and only if relationship between the syntax and the semantics. So the semantics uh, guide the, sorry, the semantics guide the syntax. However, the Valid syntax is only valid if the semantics are valid. So that means that a semantically incorrect expression becomes a compilation error. This is how, uh, the, just like the unit error that we saw with the spacecraft, should have been caught at compile time instead of runtime, or not caught at runtime in that case. Um, as I said, often space, types relate, uh, space type relations are extremely common. Uh, if you just think about the algebra in one dimension, they're very, very, uh, you will start seeing them everywhere. So whenever you identify <laughs> these types of systems, look to math to give you the consistent and powerful APIs, because these are, these often these operations are backed by mathematical proofs. They're prov uh, prov proven to be consistent, they're proven to be powerful, and and even their limitations are also known by the math. So it gives you a lot of insight about your types and it's less of an ad hoc, okay, maybe I should add this operation, maybe I should not add this operation, and then that leads to bugs and uh, using APIs. And as I said, learn more about the math of types, read more about abstract algebra, category theory. I'm dying to have some talks about category theory. Uh, 
introductory ones here. So, and even if somebody in Stockholm wants to give one, uh, we'll be happy to host you here. Um, and uh, I let Bjorn say the last sentence because I just love this one. <laughs> when in doubt. Okay, yeah, when in doubt, do what Corona does because uh, Corona is awesome uh, sure. in uh, absolutely every way. Uh, mind it though, uh, that uh, since Chrono, Adi mentioned briefly the uh, relation between uh, affine spaces and, and strong types in, in general and uh, physics units. Uh, Chrono does not allow you to, to multiply seconds, for example, multiply domain durations to get a second squared, whereas in, in a physics units <laughs> library, that is, of course, a perfectly natural thing to do. So you have to take care of, think about what, what am I modeling here? But if you're in a, a one-dimensional world, absolutely uh, do what Chrono does. If, if you're in uh, multiple dimensions, two, two dimensions, three dimensions, Chrono is often a very good guide un unless you have uh, specific reasons to do otherwise. For example, if you're modeling physical units. You want you want to do the resources, Adi? The what? Oh yeah. You yeah, want yeah, to do yeah. the, the resources? Well, we got to switch to the other slide. Okay, so we, we collected a uh, few resources. Uh, I wrote a blog post about affine space types um, at the beginning of the year, and Bjorn did his uh, type C plus plus uh, LOL talk uh, at around the same time. This is what got us started chatting on Slack and eventually led to the talk. Um, ben Dean actually just did a talk at CPPCon a couple of weeks ago called Operator Overloading History Principles and Practices, and he mentions affine types uh, briefly at, uh, after 13 minutes and seconds. Uh, <laughs> so it's a great talk, you should really watch the whole thing, but the affine types are also mentioned there. Um, this is Bjorn's example here, and my, actually my blog post has a bunch of additional more massy types uh, links uh, to the definition. Yeah. If we to go into these out, this will be on our website. Yeah, and definitely watch uh, all of Ben Dean's talk, not, not just uh, those few Please. minutes where he talks about affine spaces. <laughs> that is it. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have questions? Yeah. Uh, you have uh, to, to shout. Yeah. Wait a sec. Okay. So, uh, question number one is: uh, Is uh, Chrono going to have uh, uh, average anytime soon? You mean like the midpoint yep. uh, example? Yes. Well, you can always do the the simple math. Yes, I can. Thing, but, uh, but, 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 but it would be it would be uh, really. Cool. If we could do that, in I think that, that's an exercise to do reader. <laughs> Doing affine combinations really is uh, it's a very interesting problem. I'm not sure it's even solvable with the current C++ syntax. Yeah. Well, uh, that, that's a uh, it's, it's running to the edge. So the question is, on what side of the edge it happens Chrono, right I now? I don't think so. Okay. And the second question about the UI library. Uh, uh, the uh, there is a funny thing about it. Like if you think about uh, the uh, monitors where you display these windows, sometimes uh, or some time ago we had monitors that were where uh, the coordinates were reverted. So like zero was the left down corner, and uh, if uh, such UI library could build an abstraction that would handle both kinds of uh, uh, monitors. It would be also cool. That is a good idea. Yes. But again, you can always template your types on the policy well, of the origin. Yeah, well, the, the trick is, no, oh no, the trick is that uh, for the user of the library, it should, it should, it should, should be, be agnostic. He doesn't know which monitor you will be using, okay. and uh, 
you want to have abstraction around it. That's a good idea. Okay, we have a, a question here in Stockholm. Uh, uh, I was thinking about the examples of uh, Eigen library and the uh, GUI libraries. Uh, perhaps you could elaborate on if they're using type defs as like points versus sizes and vectors versus points. Uh, so if they're using a type def for convenience and that's an old habit or something, I don't know. Um, the I don't remember which of the GUI libraries I, I looked at that did which, but they they varied widely. Um, some of them uh, used type defs to sort of document the intent. Some did not. Some just used the naked ints everywhere. Some had at least some kind of uh, XY struct type. So they varied enormously. But no one did. No one tried to. Make a distinction between a, a position and a displacement. Yeah, actually, I think uh, I saw some even worse examples where the point and the vector were distinct types, but which didn't even interoperate properly together. But each one had a faulty API design. So it's like the worst of all worlds. Yeah. <laughs> so, you GUI library developers out there in the world, you know what to do. Wait, do we have, have another question? No, I think it's oh. C sharp win. Size and uh, type. I've often seen type uh, size as a different type, but it, again, size is more like um, sometimes it behaves like a vector, sometimes it doesn't. The problem is the API semantics. It's not necessarily the fact that there are distinct types. Okay. okay. Uh, I had two questions for you. I have a. Uh, all right. Uh, first question: You mentioned GUI libraries and algebra. Did you take a look at the 2D graphics proposal from Guy Davidson and the follow-up linear algebra that was shown at this G14? I think it was on my to-do list for a while, and then I forgot. <laughs> to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Well, we have a recording of your talk. I can always send it to Gaia. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, second question, you were talking about sources that link uh, mathematics uh, as a design principle. Uh, did you by any chance read the book that I need to read but never managed to, uh, the, the one from uh, the implementer of the STL, uh, from mathematics to generic programming, I think yes, it's called? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. I should really read that. The two books, the elements of uh, programming. programming and uh, generic um, the mathematics of generic pro of generic programming, uh, both of them are amazing books. I would recommend uh, whoever has enough time to at least read one of them. They're very similar. Uh, actually, David Sankel has several talks about using uh, category theory to uh, instruct API design which you could think of as a kind of a more general or slightly a variation on the same type of talk we just had. So look them up. I think CppCon 2016 and 2015, C++ now around 16. Cool, thanks. Malmo? More questions? All right, then thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.